Hey, everybody. Uh, this is Jeremy from the Next Big Idea Club, and I am here with Michelle Gelfins, the author of the recent Next Big Idea Club finalist, Rule Makers, Rule Breakers, How Tight and Loose Cultures Wire Our World. So, Michelle, thank you so much for joining me. It's great to be here. Great, great. So, um, so this book, um, I know resonated with so many members and was a big fan, uh, and our curators were, were a big fan of this book as well. And, uh, and so I guess just generally for anybody who may not be familiar with your work, um, what exactly is this book about? You know, what, what's your central thesis here? So this book is about ways to understand cultural differences all around the world, from our nations to our states to our organizations to our own households. And often we think about cultural differences in terms of rather superficial characteristics, like red versus blue or rich versus poor, east versus west. And I wanted to understand, are there some deeper cultural codes driving behavior? So this book is taking us on a journey to understand a really important way in which groups vary. And that is pretty simple. It's how groups uh, strictly adhere to social norms or not. It's what I call tightness versus looseness. And tight cultures have a lot of rules and a lot of regulations and a lot of punishment for deviance. And loose groups have much more flexibility and they have more permissiveness. And it's something that affects everything from our nations to our neurons, from our politics to our parenting. And so the book takes us on a journey of why these differences exist and what consequences they have and how we can use them to better our lives. Wow, that's very cool. And, and, and before we dive even further into those topics, I wanted to back up just a little bit and ask about you and how you came to the subject in the first place. So how did you become so interested in culture? So, you know, it's interesting. They say that life happens when you're making other plans. Uh, I, was, <laughs> yeah. I was a pre-med at Colgate University, and uh, I had a sort of typical New Yorker view of the world. If you remember this cartoon, there's like New York, and then we acknowledge New Jersey, but then there's yep. basically the rest of the world, like rocks <laughs> and oceans. And, you know, what's interesting is I went on a trip abroad uh, as a junior in college where that view of the world was really shattered in a really good way. I was in London, and I was experiencing a lot of culture shock, and I remember calling my father, who's from Brooklyn, and saying, Dad, it's, it's so strange, among other things, that people go from London to Paris or London to Amsterdam just for the weekend. And my dad said something really important. He said, imagine like it's going from New York to Pennsylvania. And I said, wow, what an awesome metaphor, Pop. So literally, there's a true story. The next day, I booked a trip to Egypt. I wow. had a lot of time on my hands. And I told my dad, it's like going from New York to California. He didn't buy it. Uh, but, you know, it was there in my travels in Egypt and all around the world that I started to realize that culture is so omnipresent all around us, but it's invisible and we take it for granted and it's affecting so much in the world. And so I did a big pivot. I went to get my PhD with Harry Triandis, who founded the field, and the rest is history. That's, that's great. That's so cool. Um, I know that I did a little bit of study abroad stuff myself in college, um, in particular going to Australia, and I was really struck by just how comparatively loose everything is. And, um, and that really resonated with me. And so I've even been back since because I loved it so much. Well, um, it's like this famous story about two fish who are swimming and one fit, they pass by another fish and this says, hey boys, how's the water? And they swim around, they say, what the hell is water? Because, <laughs> you know, and it's just a very simple story to say, sometimes the realities around us, the most important mm -hmm. ones, the hardest to see. And for fish, that's water, but for humans, that's culture. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's just something we take for granted. So I've been studying culture as a cross-cultural psychologist for about 25 years mm -hmm. and around the world in our states, in our organizations, just to understand how can we, how can we understand these codes that drive our behavior, the cultural codes mm -hmm. uh, that really we're not aware of. And that's what Rule Makers and Rule Breakers is about. Gotcha. That's, that's so cool. Um, and so then when it comes to um, even backing up a little bit further from your college experience, um, I have to wonder about uh, how you were raised. You know, were you <laughs> in terms of like your parents and your, and your uh, family ecosystem growing up? Was it like a tight or a loose environment? And how would you say that affected you into your adulthood? Yeah, it's really a great question. Um, and I think tight loose has a lot to do with parenting, actually. I have mm -hmm. a pink cast, damn pink cast on tight loose and parenting. And, you know, I think I grew up in a pretty loose household. I mean, relative to my husband, I veer loose and he veers tighter. He's from the mm -hmm. Midwest. I'm from New York. New York is one of the loosest states in the union. I'm mm -hmm. also came from a relatively middle upper class family that pushes groups towards looseness where you have a safety net where you can afford to break rules compared to the mm -hmm. working class, for example, which has to be tighter because you mm -hmm. can fall into poverty. Also, mm -hmm. I'm Jewish and Jewish culture, for those of you that know it, know, you know that we can't agree on anything. There's so much debate <laughs> and so much dissent 
there's a joke that there's three Jews in the room, there's 10 opinions. Um, and so <laughs> me and dissent push groups toward looseness. And um, I think what it's interesting because I really naturally navigated toward academics and academics is a very loose environment in general. It varies by department, by discipline. Uh, I mean, you need um, looseness to create ideas. I mean, you need some degree of tightness to implement them and to make them happen, uh, which is something I'll talk about later on the balance of tight and loose. But in any event, I think your household has a lot to do with, you know, your kind of programming, which is later reinforced in your schools and culture. Nowadays, I'm trying to be mindful about, you know, how do we kind of think about tight and loose in our household? Can we negotiate it? Mm -hmm. And that's what we do. We think about what domains have to be tight and what domains have to be loose. And we talk to the kids about it. And I think it's something that we can use this vocabulary to really actively create the home's envir the environment in terms of norm strength that we want and we think we need. So it's working right. out pretty well. The kids know what domains, you know, they're going to get some serious feedback about. And they know other ones like cursing and bedtime and even how messy they are kind of loose. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So, so just to be sure that, that that I've got this straight, so it sounds like so tightness is all about um, you know there are some very strict rules and regulations, and any deviation from those norms um, is 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 punished and frowned upon. Whereas in looser cultures, um, you know they still may have some rules and norms, but ultimately, if you deviate from them, that's totally okay. Um, and so when it comes to that, you know, that difference, um, why exactly do tight and loose cultures differ? What, what, and, and what sort of trade-offs are we looking at um, yeah. for each one? This is a great question. And I just want to mention that, you know, all groups have social norms. It's, in fact, one of our greatest inventions. Like, if you think about human nature, we take norms for granted all the time. You know, we don't, like, just show up to meetings half naked. You know, we don't, <laughs> we don't face backwards. Well, some of us. We don't face backwards <laughs> in elevators. You know, we reserve, you know, private settings for having, you know, sex, sexual encounters. We don't do that in public. Like, we have a lot of rules that we've agreed upon and we take for granted. And they're really critical for human sociality because they help us predict each other's behavior. They help us coordinate mm -hmm in an unbelievable way that is unprecedented in other species. And in fact, I've been doing work on tight loose, how strict or permissive groups are, even in pre-industrial societies. This is not a modern invention. We know this is something that's persisted over time. And so I set out to measure this, both in pre-industrial societies and modern nations and states. And for example, a paper we published in Science that I talk about in the book, we could differentiate cultures in general, like Japan and Germany and Austria and Singapore as veering tight even if they have some loose domains. And we can differentiate cultures like New Zealand, where people walk barefoot in banks and where they burn couches on college campuses and where there's a national wizard that's, <laughs> that was given a license by the prime minister to entertain the country. Wow. Uh, with other cultures like Greece and Brazil that in our data veer looser, even if they do have some tight domains. Mm. And one of the biggest predictors of, of tight loose in our data and also in pre-industrial societies is the amount of coordination that groups need. So I mentioned that norms help us coordinate, but some groups need more coordination. And, and that has to do with the threats that we have. So some groups around the world and in prehistory have had massive amounts of threats from Mother Nature. Call it Mother Nature's fury, constant disasters, constant fear of famine, where you need rules to coordinate to survive. But those cases are contexts where you don't want people to defect and start looting and doing all sorts of weird things. You want to trust the system and rules help us do that. Even invasions and other human threats affect tightness. So how many times in the last hundred years has your nation been potentially invaded predicts tightness today. How um, much density in your, in your land, people per capita, you know, predicts it also as early as 1500. Take, take Singapore, it has 20,000 people per square mile. It needs more rules than in New Zealand that has 50 people per square mile and more sheep per capita than people. So these are general trends. Loose groups tend to have less threat, not all of them, but they need less coordination so they can afford to be more permissive. And other factors like diversity, mobility also predict looseness where it's harder to agree on rules. But what's really fascinating, and so we can differentiate nation, states, organizations vary on tight loose. Those organizations that need more rules, that have more safety and coordination issues like airlines or nuclear power plants or police, or even contexts where there's a lot of public accountability, like in law firms um, or government types of contexts, they, they have stronger rules. They're tighter than high tech and other contexts where there's less coordination needs. Mm -hmm. In any event, um, what we do find is this really interesting trade-off that tight and loose has. And people ask me all the time, which is better, tight or loose? And the answer mm -hmm. is it depends on your criterion. So mm -hmm. tight cultures across the board have more order and loose cultures have more openness. 
And mm. each of them struggle with the opposite criteria. So like right. tight cultures have less crime, they have more uniformity, even clocks on city streets, I talk about this in the book, have more synchrony in tight cultures. They say the exact same time. Loose cultures, my data show, you're not entirely sure what time it is because all the clocks in the city streets say something somewhat different. <laughs> It is wow. true. Um, also, um, tight cultures have a lot of self-regulation. When there's a lot of potential punishments, you learn to manage your impulses. And loose cultures struggle with order. They have more crime, less synchrony. They have a lot of self-regulation failures. But loose cultures corner the market on openness. They have more openness to different people. They're more creative and they're more open to change. And I could talk about how we can kind of merge these for happy balance later. But the point is mainly that groups veer tight or loose for good reasons. It's not mm -hmm. random, and they confer certain strengths, but also liabilities to groups. Sure, of course. So, so just to be sure, again, that, that I'm getting this straight, it sounds like that the, the degree of threat is a, big, is a big determining factor in terms of how tight or loose a group is, where if there, if there are lots of threats, a group kind of says, oh, man, we have to coordinate to overcome these threats, and so we better have a bunch of rules and regulations to be sure that we can survive. And then if there aren't as many threats, a group says, eh, you know what, we don't need to coordinate for anything like, you know, like, like anything that's going to endanger our lives. So, you know what, and anything goes, it's okay. And that might be an oversimplification, but it sounds like generally that's what's going on, right? In, in general, yeah. And actually, I would just want to point out that it doesn't have to be real threat that produces tightening. In some of more recent work, you know, we, we can prime threats in the laboratory. I can bring you into the lab and tell you that for example, uh, there's an imminent terrorist threat or that there's a lot of density in the context that you're living in. I've done this in the U Maryland's campuses. It's kind of ambiguous what the population density is, unlike mm -hmm. Tokyo, where you can, can't do this study. I could tell Maryland students the place is totally dense. It's one of the densest you know, campuses in, in the U.S. versus another condition where it's very uh, sparse. And these manipulations, I call it ecological priming, can push people into a tight mindset almost immediately. Wow. Wanting stricter rules, wanting more punishments for deviance, starting to get more on the order kind of focus and to the uh, detriment of the openness kind of mm -hmm. uh, framework. Mm -hmm. We know, for example, that people who are in tight mindsets, they want autocratic leaders. They want independent leaders who are going to help to coordinate. Loose mm -hmm. mindsets produce um, the desire for collaborative and visionary leaders. Those leaders make sense in that context. Gotcha. So, so it's, it doesn't have to just be real threat. Perceived threat can produce the same tightening. Of course, it doesn't last that long in the laboratory. Um, mm -hmm. But even, for example, after the Boston bombing, I talk about this in the book. We did some surveys there right after the Boston bombing. And immediately, people who were really affected by that were starting to tighten, including mm -hmm. becoming more culturally superior and a little bit derogatory toward outgroups, which is mm -hmm. on the openness context. Mm -hmm. Of course, Boston, thank God, was not bombed repeatedly after this. And so this mm -hmm. kind of this mentality started to dissipate. As right. we predict, you know, chronic threat is what uh, produces tightening. Gotcha. Nevertheless, you know, we're dealing now not just with real threat, but with perceived threat, exaggerated threat. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's something that uh, I talk quite a bit about um, in, the, in terms of the data that supports that and how do we counteract that? Because we don't want to get too tight to sacrifice openness, but sometimes we need greater tightness in the face of collective threat. Right. Man, there, there's so many directions that I want to take that. <laughs> like, like, you know, like, like on the one hand, um, I think there's a really interesting discussion to be had about um, how, you know, maybe like, is there a meaningful difference between perceived and real threat, especially when like the media is feeding us all these horrible stories about how everything's falling apart all the time, even when there are lots of good things happening too, but obviously those don't get as much attention. But one question that I really do want to ask as well is that it seems like there's an organizational psychology dimension to this and maybe yeah. like an existential psychology dimension as well in the sense that from my perspective it sounds like if, if like let's say let's go back to the boston bombing right you know let's say i i live in boston and and there's a bombing and i think to myself oh my gosh the world is is, is chaotic and anything can happen at any time and i know but people are really people don't like this this notion that that everything's chaos and everything's meaningless and nothing makes sense it's this really terrifying yeah, uh, thought right. and so it seems like even just like from a purely like individual existential um, angle there might be this drive to reimpose a sense of order on reality and to 
tighten things up and say, well, you know, this is how things have to be from now on because things are crazy. And I just need to, even just for my own personal sanity, I need to sort of reel that, that sense of chaos back in. Is that, would you say that's fair? I think it's a really important insight. You know, we were trying to think about the trade-off between security and order on the one hand and latitude and autonomy on the other. And um, when we have a lot of disorder, Fromm talked about this, Eric Fromm talked about this, you know, we feel chaos, chaos around us, it's really uh, untenable. Like we want strict rules and we want mm. tightness to help us cope with that kind of chaos. As one example of that, um, and I think this is a problem happening all around the world. I mean, after Mubarak was ousted in Egypt, I was on the ground getting data there mm. with my RAs. And you know, wow. we predicted that you, know, you take a tight ruler out, it goes from total tightness, but what happened in Egypt is it went to the exact opposite, to chaos. Mm. Mm. The total, Durkheim would call it anime, just normlessness. You know, people were screaming freedom, but actually they had no ability to coordinate because autocrats wow. would get rid of civil society because if you have mm. strong civil society, you can get rid of the autocrat. So mm. they're smart. And so what I saw in that context is that people's perception in Egypt about this chaos and this disorder predicted their desire for a Salafi or Muslim Brotherhood government. It's what wow. I call autocratic recidivism. It's like you can see this pattern where people feel chaos, they want order. It happened in Russia. A whole chapter I have on this called Culture Revenge. Mm. I talk about even Duterte. Why do people support this guy? We in the U.S. think he's kind of crazy. But mm. actually, people on the ground in, in, in the Philippines were experiencing tremendous amount of disorder. Um, mm. And so there's a lot to be said about this. And before the Trump election um, and before the Le Pen election, my colleague Josh Jackson, Jesse Harrington, and I went out. We were surveying people about the percentage of threat in the United States. And, mm-hmm. you know, the, we have data that show the U.S. has loosened over the last 200 years, you know, with some mm-hmm. exceptions. We have some work that we just published on this in Nature Human Behavior that's not in the book. Um, mm-hmm. But we could see that people who felt that the U.S. had a lot of threats, whether perceived or actual, from ISIS or North Korea or immigration, thought the U.S. was way too loose and this mm. was, in fact, in turn affecting the desire for Trump. And the same exact threat to desire tightness, to desire for Le Pen was found in France. Wow. Uh, and we just published this paper in Plus One. And I mean, I think this is a, it's not like a pattern that is just found in this crazy historical moment. <laughs> like you yeah. pointed out, this is something that we've seen throughout the centuries where people's feelings of chaos and disorder makes them want autocratic leaders. And Part of that psychology is that these leaders, whether they know it or not, are almost good cultural psychologists. They target groups that feel threatened, they mm. amplify those threats, and they use that psychology to get elected. Yeah. Um, and we've recently been creating some threat dictionaries where you can diagnose threat in speeches, in text. Wow. How cool. is that affecting our psychology at the me- uh, kind of you know, state, community level, psychological level? So this is a law, this is a really important question, and, and it's, it becomes part of the book toward the end of the book after I lay out, you know, through the journey, how you understand tight loose differences, you know, here, there, and everywhere. Right. And, and I'm really glad that you brought up the, the political angle here, because um, I wanted to ask more about that, because in your book, you mentioned that measures of tightness were the highest predictors of a, state, of a state's likelihood for voting for Donald Trump. And, um, and I just, that was, that was shocking to me, because I know that so many metrics uh, were so wrong about the outcome of the 2016 election. And here it seems like you may have, you may have discovered one that might actually get it right, not just <laughs> in 2016, but maybe in 2020 and beyond. So th- that being the case, you know, with this 2020 election you know, coming up uh, just next year, what advice would you give to uh, presidential candidates as they are trying to refine their campaign strategies? Yeah, I think it's a great question. Of course, there's not one answer to this question. I think one of the things that I, I think we kind of missed out on in the election, and this was also the case in Brexit, this is not an American phenomenon, is not understanding the, the fact that the working class has, is really struggling and feeling incredible amounts of threat. Mm. Um, the United States is a loose culture in general. Unlike in Germany, where there's like standardized ways that people in vocational occupations get training, get certificates to be able to go back and forth between organizations, there's a safety net for the working class um, in mm. Germany and in other cultures. And I think that what we fail to realize is that there are some groups that really are threatened and that we need to really reach out and try to help these groups create partnerships between government and community colleges and industry uh, in order to help people because they are really struggling. And, um, you know, we do work on the on the working class and we know that um, they really struggle with worrying constantly about falling into poverty. 
Mm. And I think one campaign strategy has to be to try to reach out to those populations to deal with real threat. Mm. Uh, of course, there's a lot of manufactured threat out there too, but we need to really focus on those communities where they're becoming ghost towns. You know, they're, this yeah. is not, you know, this is, you know, people are navigating to explanations like immigration, but we know a lot of it has to do with AI. But what we mm. need to do is really help them and get out yeah. there and say, we know what you're going through and we're there with you. Uh, because that will be a medicine that's important. I think, you know, basically like um, bashing Trump is not going to help because yeah. when people really like someone, it's, they become part of their self-concept. So when you bash Trump, you bash me. And, right. I mean, not me because I don't vote for Trump. Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> I want to make that clear to this audience. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I know. I mean, I really respect the fact that we need to understand why people are voting for Trump mm. and the, why it might be rational. Um, and then try to deal with those fears that people are having um, uh, and get out to these communities. Because I think that the Democratic Party has come off, you know, I think wrongly so, but as being elitist and not being right. in touch with the real fears, the fears that are driving these election dynamics. Right. No, I, I, and that last point I think is so important because as much as, um, you know, I used to love watching, you know, John Stewart's, uh, you know, The Daily Show and yeah. Stephen Colbert and The Colbert Report, of course. I mean, you know, fantastic shows. Um, but I think ultimately um, they kind of, they, they, in some ways I think they make the problem worse just because you're right. I think that the left often does come off as kind of elitist yeah. and just kind of bashing Trump and say, ah, oh, well, these right wingers are just all dumb. Like, Ultimately, that just kind of exacerbates the problem without totally. really addressing the root cause. Totally. Um, and so also, the other thing I'm just saying, make, make about that other point is that, you know, it's really a bizarre puzzle that Trump is the quintessential norm violator, right? You know, he violates norms all the true. time. And, yeah. and the question is, why do the people that he's appealing to, like the, the working class base, which in our data tends to be tight, worried about falling into, into poverty, why do they tolerate that? And I think the mm. answer is, at least one answer is that they feel like he's promising to bring them back to a tight traditional order that they're used to. Mm -hmm. uh, and so what he does, they, you know, in his language and all these other weird things he does don't really matter because what really the highest goal, in, in, I think, in a lot of these communities is just to get back to a place that makes sense, that's less chaotic, right. that's less scary. Uh, yes. And so that's where we can understand a little bit of this puzzle of this egregious norm violation on the one hand and the tightening that he does on the other. So I think those, th these are basic psychological principles that I would hope, you know, we can get out to the Democratic Party <laughs> um, and, you know, try to uh, help with uh, understanding really what's happening, what's really driving these dynamics and getting beyond the, what, you know, these name calling kind of strategies, which are just really problematic. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, hopefully um, uh, Elizabeth Warren and, and all the other candidates will be watching this interview at some point. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I also wanted to uh, get to some of the questions and comments submitted by Next Big Idea Club members, because awesome. yeah, as I said earlier in the conversation, this is a book that really resonated with a lot of them. And they brought up some really interesting points, both in our in our Facebook group and in our member library. Um, and so, for example, um, Lisa Westbrook was saying, she said, I'm thinking about how this book um, in particular um, applies to hiring managers and what companies should be looking for yeah. um, when it comes to a good manager that fits with their culture. So what, what, what advice um, or insights would you provide yeah. um, on that topic in particular? Yeah, this is such an incredibly important question because just like in nations, in organizations, we tend to ignore culture. Right? We tend to, it's invisible. We don't really understand what's the underlying cultural DNA that differentiates our organizations from others. And tight loose is certainly one of them. Mm -hmm. And we know from the, uh, in the chapter I talk about in tight loose organizations that the people and the practices and the leaders really vary in tight and loose organizations. So one mm -hmm. of the first things we need to do is understand where does our organization fall on this continuum? Mm -hmm. um, you know, the people in tighter organizations tend to be more conscientious and careful. The practices tend to be more standardized and more efficient and formal, and the leaders tend to be more independent. And that's really a big contrast from looser organizations that where people are more open and more risk taking, where the practices are much more, have much more discretion and they're more informal, sometimes pretty chaotic. <laughs> and yeah. the leaders tend to be visionary and collaborative and they, they live in different ecosystems. They live in contexts and tight organizations that require coordination, as we talked about, versus uh, in loose contexts where there's, you can afford to be more permissive, where there's more mobility and diversity and less coordination needs. So the first thing to do is to diagnose where are we in our organization? I mean, some pockets in every organization can be tight or loose, but it's important to think about where, where is that manager going to be fitting into in terms of these, these demands of tight and loose. 
we have a tight loose mindset quiz on my website um, oh, cool. that uh, I developed based on you know some member feedback and other people said I want to be able to diagnose myself on how tight mm-hmm. or loose I am because that's what we're thinking about we hire managers you know are you the metaphor that I use in the book is are you a chaos muppet or are you an order muppet this comes from Sesame Street from Dial oh, okay. the um, type of metaphor and so you know you have the kind of order muppets like Kermit the Frog and Bert who like rules and have a lot of um, prevention focus. They're rule oriented and they like structure and order. And then the chaos Muppets like Cookie Monster and Ernie and so forth, you know, they like, you know, don't attend to rules as much and they're more impulsive, but they're also embrace ambiguity. Now, of course, we all have some degree of order and chaos Muppet within us. But I we, love that. we, tend, by the way, <laughs> we <laughs> tend to, we can veer tight or loose for good reasons based on our parental socialization, based on our culture, based on our class and so forth and our gender. And so it's good to first diagnose like what's the organizational needs when it comes to tight and loose and then think about the fit with that person. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's one thing I want to mention. And I talk quite a bit about that, even when it comes to mergers between companies also, because Mm -hmm. I, I talk about the problem, what happens when tight and loose organizations merge, the price tag is really big if you don't negotiate this. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So in any way, yeah. Yeah, well, just just a maybe a quick follow up question there. Like, let's say um, that I've got an organization of mostly chaos muppets, um, and if I'm trying to, if I'm looking for a manager for them, do I want another chaos muppet <laughs> because because he because he or she would uh, would fit in yeah. nicely with the pre existing culture, or do I want more of an order muppet to create this kind of complementary yeah. yin yang thing? Yeah, this is such a great question, and. Um, you know, really the best managers, I would argue, are ambidextrous when it comes to mm-hmm. tight and loose. They know where to deploy tightness when things are getting too loose. Um, I call this structured looseness, inserting some structure into a loose company that might be getting kind of disorderly. We might mm-hmm. nominate Tesla as one example of that. Yep. On the flip side, you know, sometimes you need to loosen up tight cultures. A leader needs to understand when is an organization getting too tight. And I would mm. nominate United for that, in that mm. case. I mean, this place needs to veer tight. We don't want those people making a lot of weird decisions. It's an airline. <laughs> That's but, true. but we can argue that, and I did argue this uh, in the book, that that context got too tight. They were normatizing everything. And my interviews with people from United suggested that they felt like they were following the rules blindly. In that case, mm. we need more flexible tightness. A leader mm-hmm. that's able to find some domains to insert some discretion into the system. Mm-hmm. And so in many ways, um, we need to be on the lookout for when these dynamics are changing in either direction and getting too extreme. Because mm-hmm. we know that extreme tightness or extreme looseness has a lot of problems. Mm-hmm. And there's a whole chapter in the book on the Goldilocks effect of clearly groups like organizations need to veer tight or loose for good reasons. But the danger is getting too extreme in either direction whether it's nations or organizations or our households. The Mm -hmm. best parents are also able to balance tight and loose because we know that helicopter parents and laissez-faire parents produce maladaptive kids. So Mm -hmm. it's the same principle that, in any way, the the long answer to your question is that we need to be able to understand uh, and and, and get leaders who are ambidextrous and understand Mm -hmm. this construct. I did a workshop at Harvard during my sabbatical on this with some chief learning officers who said, wow, we have a new vocabulary to go mm-hmm. back to our organizations and understand you know, the dynamics of what's happening when it comes to culture change. Because the last thing I'll say about this is that the best leaders understand the needs that people have. In loose mm-hmm. context, they have a need for autonomy. So more oversight is really painful and you have to really negotiate that st- additional structure. In tight mm-hmm. cultures, people have a need for order. So introducing sudden changes, we're going to become looser, is pretty scary on the flip side. And I've seen Mm -hmm. that when talking to managers in Mm -hmm. interviews in the book. So the best leaders are ambidextrous and they understand the psychological needs of these different groups and how to negotiate them. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, so I'm glad that you brought up um, that Goldilocks principle there because I was just going to say it sounds like, like most things, there's a sort of a healthy balance to be struck. And I I seem to remember... um, from uh, from 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 Taoism, uh, there's this whole notion of uh, of the Tao, you know, or or the way, which is kind of um, it's walking that fine line, sort of between order and chaos, yes, where right. it's it's not all all one thing, it's not all the other thing, it's just kind of towing that line, and it's and, and it's it seems to me that you're never going to get it perfect, you know, and and at different times that balance will look different, um, but ultimately it seems like it's about 
kind of um, just incorporating both into your organization. That's right. Um, That's right. And being strategic about it. You know, so mm-hmm. for example, when Amazon and Whole Foods merged, I, I have an HBR paper on that. And I talked about this in the book, you know, they really analyzed their strategic compatibilities. Oh, we're going to really help each other and our needs in terms of financial types of issues. Mm-hmm. But they didn't think about the cultural compatibility. And mm-hmm. they had a lot of problems. I mean, they'd gotten much better, but they had a lot of problems at first, just like Daimler Chrysler and other ones where they looked like a match made in heaven. Mm. But they were to just sit down and do a cultural assessment of the organizations and in the tighter context and think about where can we give up some of this control? Where can mm. we insert some discretion and vice versa on the flip side? I think, mm. you, know, you know, Whole Foods suffered a lot because their, a lot of their discretion was taken away. And mm. that was a core cultural value. And that's right. not to say that you, can't, you, have, you have to make some trade ups. You have to uh, tighten up a little bit. That was the whole, men, you know, kind of beauty of the merger is to mm-hmm. help them financially. But we could have thought about what areas can we maintain that discretion right. um, and so that it's less bumpy ride. So yeah. that's right. I think once you have the vocabulary and you understand this is negotiable, you just got to talk about it. I'm not saying it's easy. There's lots of ways that you can merge and, 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 and deal with cultural change efforts. There's no one magic you know, solution. And I talk about different strategies that have worked uh, mm-hmm. uh, in the book on the chapter on Titan was org. Um, and I think it's just exciting to think about it as negotiable, even in our own lives. Think about conflicts you have with your in-laws, for example. Like yeah. my, my family tends to veer looser and I have in-laws that veer tighter. And mm. we on vacations have a lot of tight, loose conflict in terms of yeah. structure versus spontaneity, for example. Mm. And we can sort of think about, wait, I'm a negotiation scholar. So I could say, wait, what's my highest priorities? And what are your highest priorities for our needs on tight, loose? And let's negotiate it. Sounds a little bit cheesy, and I know it, it does sound very really cheesy, but we, can, but we can do it, and we can make our vacations much more fun. But once we understand yeah. some of the conflicts we have with our colleagues or our, our bosses or our kids and our neighbors or in-laws, I'll nominate that as a big you know, source of oh, yeah. conflict, that um, understanding where these differences coming from are coming from can help us empathize with other people. And um, often we also need each other's strengths because... Like I mentioned, if I'm looser, my liabilities are being kind of disorderly. And, sure. and someone who's tighter, their liabilities are more on the open side. So coming together, and it can be really very beneficial. I think so. Yeah, it seems like this framework is such a useful tool for crossing boundaries, whether they're um, you know, political or social or, or, or religious or, or, or any other type. So, um, so hopefully, you know, people can sort of take that into lots of different dimensions of their lives. And, um, and there was one other um, comment from a member that I wanted to get to uh, before I let you go in a few minutes, because I thought this was um, a, such an interesting, um, a, such an interesting like, place to apply these ideas. Um, Popsi Kanagaratnam is saying that she was thinking about uh, this in the context of the culture in K through 12 schools. Mm-hmm. And part of the reason I bring this up um, is because uh, just recently here at Next Big Idea Club HQ, um, author Nir Eyal was in conversation with Ariana Huffington, and he was talking about why so many teens in particular are drawn to using social media, um, sometimes to unhealthy degrees. And the reason that he gave is that he, say, he says, look, you know, look at the structure of schools. You know, in school, we tell these kids um, what to do, where to be, who to socialize with for hours and hours at a time every single day. And in, in, in Nir's view, the only other place where we do that to such an extent is prison. And so <laughs> here we have such a tight environment, right? And so these, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, I was saying Gotham is our funerals, you know, there's other really yeah. tight contexts, but that's of right, course. that's right. Of course, hopefully you're not going to a funeral every yeah. day from, from, you know, yeah. every day, like, like school, right? But, um, but so his, his central argument is he's like, look, you know, these school environments are so tight that when you have an environment like social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, where anything goes, you know, where it's super loose, you have these, these kids who feel the need to then yeah. flee to these looser environments yeah. just to create a sense of balance. So I don't know, like, I'm just wondering if you feel like there's some legitimacy to that and, yeah. and <laughs> would you add any, any insights there? Yeah, I have an N of one response to that. And then I have a broader response to okay. one has to my daughter. And I was just talking to my teenage daughter about this. And I said, sweetie, you know, what is your theory on social media? Do you think it's a bad thing for kids or is it a good thing? She's like, mom, you adults don't get it. And she didn't use the word tightness, though she often does because she knows I talk about it. But she's like, we are so stressed out from all the deadlines and all the stuff we have to do in school that this is an escape for us. This helps us to go online and see these weird videos and so forth. Now, with that said, I think it's also really more broadening out 
It's a general principle that when you have a lot of tightness, when you escape that context, you can go to the opposite extreme. I've seen it with kids who are in very strict households. And in fact, when they get to college, they might lose control because they mm -hmm. haven't had the sort of developed self-regulation mechanisms on their own because they've just been monitored and, and, and abiding by rules without thinking about them in their households. The same is the case in the military, by the way. I'm actually doing a lot of work now with the military because when people live on tight ships all the time and then they leave those environments, they can lose control um, mm. uh, off site and have mm. a lot of counterproductive work behaviors. And the question again is, how do you help those systems that have to be tight? Schools need to be organized, but how do you insert some discretion into those systems? Yeah. Um, and, and that's, again, the flexible tightness idea. And I'm working with uh, the military to think about how can leaders identify ways in which they can give a little more steam, a little, a little more, let people have more, let off some steam, have more discretion in non-safety related areas. And the same can be said in households, in schools. Uh, schools also vary a lot on tight loose, by the way. I mean, you can think about very unstructured schools that are, don't follow that pattern that he mentioned um, versus money the school, the public schools in particular, have a lot of rules and they are extremely tight. And I think mm -hmm. teachers can use this construct also to think about how to design, um, you know, have you know, balance of freedom of constraint in school settings. Mm -hmm. Also, they can use it to understand students who are coming in from very tight backgrounds and expecting certain levels. They have to negotiate this with kids who come from very different backgrounds, some of whom really want a lot more discretion and some of whom are not used to it. Right. Um, so you'll see more about that in the book on, you know, negotiating this, whether it's teachers or leaders or parents. <laughs> um, sure. And I really, yeah. I really love talking. I could talk to you for another couple hours about this. And I really encourage the members to reach out to me with their stories on Tight Loose. One of the most gratifying things through my website, there's a place to send in stories. And one mm -hmm. of the best parts of writing a book for a general audience as a scientist is that I want to hear from you guys. How is, how is this construct relevant? For you. Um, and those stories are the best part of this book. There's no mm -hmm. question of having written this book. That, that's so great. Yeah, I mean, as, as you and I were talking about a little bit before this conversation, you know, a lot of the time, academics are kind of it's sort of trapped in a bubble. They are a little bit in ivory tower. Totally trapped. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so, it, and so it's, it's great to see, yeah. you know, that, that you can step out and like actually change people's lives with these ideas. Um, because I, I, really do want, I do want to mention back to Marty from Brooklyn, my dad. Sure. Who had the going, it's like going from New York to Pennsylvania. I wrote this book for him because he mm -hmm. said, I can never understand what you're doing. You need, <laughs> you need to get outside of this weird language. Mm -hmm. And every, my dad read every chapter and I got the wow. pop test, I mean, including Rick Horgan, my, my uh, Scribner editor. But mm -hmm. it was really gratifying to, to write this book for my dad and my academic advisor, Harry Trianda. So uh, I hope it, you know, it's accessible, but it's based on science. And that's, I think, the great Goldilocks Yes. Um, and I hope that the readers enjoy it and send in their comments and, and stories. Yeah. Well, we're off to a great start here. And, and maybe just before I let you go, one last, one last, last question for you, um, which is that, you know, as I said at the beginning of this conversation, this is a book that has resonated not just with our curators, but also with tons of our members already. And so I guess, you know, my last question would be if you wanted everyone to take away one insight or one idea from this book to then go and bring into their everyday lives. Um, what, might that, what might that be? Well, I think that the idea is that we need to be culturally intelligent. You mm. know, we think about intelligence. We all know about that. We think about emotional intelligence. Okay, we got that. But really in this ever globalizing and polarized world, we really need to understand culture. And we invented culture as humans. I mean, it's our most amazing accomplishment, social norms in particular, are just this amazing thing that we built, but we don't understand how it's affecting our behavior. And a very simple principle in terms of tight and loose can help to reduce the sort of sense of puzzlement that we have about many issues from Duterte mm -hmm. to failed mergers and acquisitions to socializing our children um, to the rise of populism. I think it's not the only principle that can help explain these things, but like in physics or biology or other fields, there are some, you know, kind of pretty simple principles that can explain some parts of the world. And I think that this is an effort to help do that. And again, it doesn't explain everything, <laughs> but it's, a, it's something that we can use to diagnose what's happening in the dynamics in our households to our nations and, uh, and it, it, with just one shift in perspective. So that would be my goal. <laughs> love it. I love it. Um, well, well, once again, everybody, as you know, uh, the book is Rule Makers, Rule Breakers. Um, go pick up a copy. It's excellent. 
Uh, but uh, until then, uh, Michelle Galpin, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks a lot, guys.